if we sort of ignore the short-lived emperors of the Heraclean dynasty like Constantine III and Heraclonus, what we're left with are four Heraclean emperors who had a chance to make an impact on the world. And of those four, Heraclius and his great-great-grandson, Justinian II, are by far the best known. Heraclius was this heroic figure who defeated the Persians and then died a broken man after the Arab invasions. And Justinian II was this almost evil but absolutely fascinating figure who simply would not relinquish power and ultimately died in the pursuit of imperial authority. So that leaves Constans II and his son Constantine IV left in the lurch a bit. They accomplished pretty important things in their own right, and they're absolutely worthy of the Heraclean name. But they rarely get as much credit because they don't really have an iconic moment in the same way that someone like Heraclius or Justinian II does. Although, it's not that they don't have those iconic moments, it's simply that those moments are far less known. And in the case of Constans II, as we'll see, the thing that would make him one of Byzantium's greatest emperors is something that hasn't quite been completely proven in terms of whether or not he was the primary driver of this reform. Of course, the reform I'm referring to is the in implementation of the thematic system. But we'll get into all that in due time. So let's take a look at Constans II the Bearded, who ruled from 641 until 668. Let's do a brief review to let everyone remember how Constans II is related to all of the foregoing members of the Heraclean dynasty. So he's the grandson of Heraclius, and he is the son of Constantine III and his wife Gregoria. In addition, he's the nephew of Heraclonus, who was a son of Heraclius by his second wife Martina. And if we'll recall, Heraclius and Martina were uncle and niece. So actually, it you know you could make an argument that there are other ways you could say that they're related, but the most direct one is as um, uncle and nephew if we're talking about Heraclonus and Constans II. So about Constans' name, he was actually baptized as Heraclius, but for reasons that should become abundantly clear when we talk about how he actually got the crown put on his head in the first place, um, he was given the regnal name of Constantine. But later on, the diminutive Constans became standard in Byzantine historiography for reasons that I don't understand, and uh, it just it just stuck. So that's why we call him Constans II, even though in his own time he reigned as Constantine. He was born in 630, so that means that during the turmoil of 641, he was 11 years old. So old enough to know what's going on, kind of, but not quite old enough to really play a leading role. So let's do a year in review for 641, since this is a date with four different emperors wearing a crown and exercising imperial authority, and one empress to boot. So in February of 641, the long-suffering Heraclius finally died, and that left his son Constantine III, who would have been in his late 20s, and Heraclonus, who would have been a bit younger, somewhere in his teens, on the throne as co-emperors. Now, Constantine III died in May of that year, and then there was suspicion about his death that surrounded Heraclonus, but mostly it surrounded Martina, Heraclonus' mother. And the reason for this suspicion was that Martina and Heraclius had been uncle and niece, and that people had seen this as an impious arrangement. In addition, Heraclonus was actually their fourth son as a couple, but he was the first one who did not have um, developmental disabilities and who was capable of ruling the empire. So, um, because of this, there was a lot of discontent surrounding uh, the idea of having Martina running the show in the name of her son Heraclonus, and there was some popular um, support for the, I guess, elder line of the Heraclean dynasty, which would be represented by the heirs of Constantine III. And also, um, it's actually not all that likely that Martina had anything to do with Constantine III's death. He was not in good health throughout his entire life. He was sickly. 
um, even as a young man. He probably had something like cancer or something of that nature, and it was slowly eating away at him, so he ended up only living until May. Um, and what ended up happening is that on his deathbed, it looks like Constantine the Third had given money and support to a general named Valentinus on the understanding that Valentinus would back young Constans against uh, Martina and Heraclonus when, you know, Constantine kicked the bucket, which looked like it was coming soon, and he predicted correctly. So what happens is that Valentinus and others in the capital agitate and force um, Heraclonus and Martina to have Constans II crowned as a co-emperor. And at that time, he would have taken the name Constantine because that would remind people of his father and his um, sort of taking up the mantle of his father and that legitimate line of the family. I guess he also could have used his um, personal name Heraclius. That would have been fine, I imagine, since that recalled the grandfather. But maybe people had gotten a little sick of Heraclius by that point because his last years had been a bit disappointing and you know he probably had to be kept out of the public eye to some extent. At any rate, um, what ends up happening is a few months later, after um, Constans is crowned at some point in the summer, Valentinus and his troops forcibly remove Martina and Heraclonus in September of 641, and they inflict mutilation and then send them into exile. If you want to learn more about that, I have videos on both Martina and Heraclonus that you can um, check out. While most modern scholars are pretty skeptical of the idea that Martina had Constantine III killed, that was something that was current among lots of people in the capital because they simply didn't like her and that's what they wanted to believe. So young Constans II gave a speech in front of the Senate where he basically repeated that story and said that Martina definitely killed his father and that um, he thanked all the people present for helping him to avenge his father's death and then the Senate set up a Council of Regency for the young ruler, and this council was headed by the Patriarch Paul II and a few other prominent senators. Um, also, this is a good time to mention that it looks like the Byzantine uh, Senate retained almost all of the functions of the old Roman Senate, at least as the Roman Senate had functioned in the imperial period. There's actually a newish book out about that topic by Anthony Caldellus. I haven't had the chance to read it, but I know a few people who have and uh, it's something I would definitely want to check out in the near future. Maybe I'll even make a video about it at some point. At any rate, um, from what I can gather, it looks like the Regency probably ended around 646, and this is just a subjective evaluation. Also, it's one that uh, Joy uh, John Joyce Norwick made, of all people, and although he's not the world's most reliable source of information, um, he did make a good point. Uh, we'll see that in that year, Constans will issue a, an edict on religion that will show off his autocratic character and will sort of um, be in keeping with what we know of his character. So, uh, yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and guess 646, but I don't really know for certain. I think usually you were considered to be a full adult at about the age of 15 during this period. Um, so it would also add up in that regard. He would have been about 15 or 16 when that document would have been released, so it all kind of fits together. If we've learned anything from Roman and Byzantine history, it should be that anytime you have an emperor who's too young, too old, has no military experience, or is otherwise vulnerable, that that person is going to be very vulnerable to coups by people who are well-placed militarily. And the reign of Constans II bears this out once again. So, um, his key supporter early on was one of his father's friends, General Valentinus, and it only took him a few years to decide to try to launch a coup against the emperor before he really reached his manhood. So, Valentinus apparently um, was a descendant of the former dynasty in Armenia, the Arsacid dynasty, which was a sub-branch of the old Parthian royal family, the Parthian Empire, of course, being the Persian Empire, which preceded the, Sas the Sasanian Empire. Um, now, it's sort of an odd betrayal, given what we know of the circumstances, and also given how much control Valentinus already enjoyed of the government. 
So, by around 642 or so, we know that Valentinus was the chief general of Byzantium, and he seems to have been someone who exercised power either in the Council of Regency or outside of it, but still was more or less able to direct affairs as he pleased. And that Constans II had married his daughter Fausta, someone who he never divorced, by the way, and would go on to have three children by, one of whom would go on to be emperor. Um, in 643 to 44, Valentinus led out the Byzantine army to fight the Arabs. At one point, it looks like he had them caught in a pincer, but somehow he bungled, and he ended up being heavily defeated. And then the next year, 644 to 45, he decided to try to seize the throne. It's possible that people were calling him incompetent and that he was on the verge of losing his favor and that this was an attempt to uh, reclaim his relevance by force. I don't know the exact details, and I guess they're not really recorded, but at any rate, we know that the patriarch and the people of the city were not having it, and he and his uh, messenger who announced that he was the new emperor were both torn to shreds by the crowd just right there in the streets or in the Hippodrome or wherever they were at the time. Let's take a look at the world from the eyes of Constans II and his advisors. The world that he had inherited from his grandfather Heraclius was one that didn't hold out a ton of promise. He had inherited one of the greatest crises in Byzantine history, the Arab invasions. So this was going to be something that he'd have to resolve. His grandfather Heraclius had not been able to turn back the Arab invasions the same way that he had been able to deal with the Persian invasions. And as I, as I suggested in my Heraclius video, part of the fault may have uh, may lie with the fact that Heraclius had fatally weakened the Sasanians, and without an effective Sasanian state in place, the Arabs didn't have enough pressure put upon them from the east. At any rate, by the time that Constans II was on the throne, and this is something that would have been perhaps truer for his regents than for himself, Mesopotamia, Syria, and Palestine were all lost. Egypt, Armenia, and eastern Anatolia were now under constant threat from Arab armies. At this point, it's probably not yet clear to the people living at the time that these losses were permanent, but what was very clear is that with the eastern provinces in enemy hands, Byzantium's revenue was greatly diminished. In addition, the Balkans had been overrun under Heraclius' leadership, so the empire was without one of its major recruiting centers and also some of its revenue as well. So that meant that the place that they were having to rely upon for most of their recruiting and most of their revenue was Anatolia. So this was sort of the grand strategic situation which faced Constans, and you can imagine that he and his generals were looking for opportunities to take back lands and restore governance there to add more resources and enable yet further conquest. One factor that they didn't seem to be able to cope with, however, was that the new invaders, uh, the new occupiers of these lands, the Arabs, were generally relatively popular and well received by the native subjects in the regions because the Arabs, for the most part, were tolerant rulers during this period, and they also did not impose a very heavy tax burden. Let's backtrack for just a bit. So following the Battle of Yarmouk and the loss of the Near East to the Arab invaders, um, the Arab forces had then moved into Egypt and begun taking over the Byzantine possessions there starting in 639. When Heraclius had died in 641, that was still an ongoing battle, and this remained the case throughout the very short reigns of Constantine III and Heraclonus. Well, young Constans II inherited this mess, and this was a war the Byzantines were very clearly losing. In 642, Alexandria had been under, under siege from an Arab army, and the Byzantine garrison there had negotiated their surrender and sailed out of Alexandria. Now, a few years later, a Byzantine fleet under a commander named Manuel will return with an army and recapture Alexandria, but after about a year or so, he will lose a major battle against an Arab army um, inland from Alexandria, and that will weaken his position enough that he'll be forced to then evacuate Egypt altogether once again in 646. 
and then after that the Byzantines more or less give up their design of reconquering Egypt. Now one common myth that a lot of people believe is that the Great Library at Alexandria was destroyed during the Arab invasions. Most likely it was burned down before that due to neglect and rioting in the city. If it did still stand in the 640s, then it's very likely that this library had already been long denuded of all of its scrolls and books. Um, it looks like quite a few people, uh, you know, anecdotally we hear of people taking scrolls from the library. So uh, most likely anything that had been there was either gone in terms of having been stolen or just having, uh, having been neglected and allowed to rot. So uh, this myth is something that really needs to be busted. Despite the grave crisis facing the Byzantine Empire, a Christian Empire, from a new enemy which had a new religion, theological debates among Christians proceeded as if nothing were to matter. And in 646, Orthodox and Monothelite Christians are still at odds over Christology, debating the energy and will of Christ and all of that stuff. Well, Constans II wasn't having any of that, so he issued an order called the Typos, meaning type, and this basically assigned punishments for any continued talk about the issue. So if you were a bishop and you tried to bring this up, you would be removed from your see, and there were punishments for bureaucrats and soldiers and all kinds of people, usually involving the loss of your position. I think if you're a senator, you lose your property. Anyway. Um, what this is, is it's more or less the first real showing of Constan's autocratic style of rule. You would think that someone who came up under the tutelage of the Senate would be a little more collegial and be a little bit more open to discussion and debate, but that was not the personality of Constan's, and we'll see that this is a personality that he passed on to his son and grandson in the course of time. Um, and that's also why uh, this is usually the date that a lot of people look to as when the Regency ended and Constans II began to really rule in his own right. Now, of course, if you tell a bunch of Christian bishops that they're not allowed to debate theology, you're basically telling them that they can't do their job. So in 649, Pope Martin I in Rome convened a council and they condemned the Typos. And apparently they did so in relatively mild language though, so far as condemnations go but it's still enough to absolutely infuriate young Constanza II, and we'll see in due time how he responds to that. So as is so often the case, when emperors try to intervene in religious affairs, sometimes things blow up in their faces. Um, the exarch Gregory in Carthage revolted against the empire that same year in 646, some people have speculated that this revolt was inspired by his opposition to Constans Typos. It could also have just been a purely um, opportunistic thing that was done because um, Gregory is now going to face a great crisis and he would be better off having um, no one to answer to if he's going to try to deal with this great invasion in North Africa. However, um, Arab forces quickly swept through Gregory's army, which supposedly was 120,000 men, and they were able to conquer North Africa, killing Gregory the Usurper in the process. Um, keep in mind, one of the key advantages that the Arabs in, uh, enjoyed in North Africa is that there were heavy Bedouin populations nearby, and the Bedouins tended to be militarily compatible with the Arabs, and they all, the Bedouin also tended to be fairly open to joining with the Arabs and uh, often converting to Islam as well. So basically there was a, you know, they could recruit on the fly as they're invading some of these areas in North Africa. At any rate, um, later on, a bit of a side note, there will be a caliphal civil war. We'll get into the details of that later. And the Byzantines will then be able to dispatch an expedition to Africa and reclaim Carthage uh, during that five year period when um, Muawiyah and Ali are fighting over the title of caliph. At the same time that Constans would have been receiving news about the usurpation of his exarch in Carthage and then his subsequent death at the hands of yet another Arab army, 
Um, he would also have been receiving news about setbacks on his own eastern frontier. So in 647, Arab forces won major victories in Armenia and then managed to penetrate deep into Cappadocia, which up to this time had been holding out. Um, the central Anatolian city of Caesarea was destroyed, and that was a major defeat for the Byzantines. In addition, a couple years later in 650, Arab forces managed to capture the Syrian coastal city of Eridus. Um, there were more Arab offensives in the Cilicia and Asaria in 650 and 651, and at that point, um, you know, the Arab armies were getting far too close to Constan's source of power and he was looking to you know, have a truce to regroup. Um, the opponent who directed pretty much all of these operations, either directly or indirectly, was the governor of Syria, Muawiyah. And because Muawiyah will figure so prominently in um, affairs between the Caliphate and the Byzantine Empire, I think that it's worth looking at Muawiyah in detail. So, Muawiyah had been born in Mecca in 602, and he was the governor in Syria from about 639 onward. His clan was called the Umayyad clan. Um, they were not directly related to the clan uh, of um, Muhammad's family, but they were still a very well-placed clan with a long history in the city of Mecca. And as such, uh, members of their family tended to be highly regarded and also um, had to be appeased politically. So from about the time of his appointment in 639 until his death in 680, Muawiyah's primary aim was the conquest of Byzantium. Um, now, Constans, he was the great rival of Constans II because of this, um, and he would be the author of most of Constans' woes in his life. In addition, um, Muawiyah, because of his long life, would also go on to be the great rival of Constantine IV as well. And if we look over the course of Byzantine history, there aren't very many foes that they faced who are more formidable than Muawiyah. So, ultimately, right after the raids into Asaria and Cilicia, Constans II and Muawiyah struck an agreement to make a two-year truce. But, while you would think that this would favor the Byzantines, since they were clearly getting their asses kicked on all fronts, it actually ended up favoring the clever Muawiyah, who had plans for what to do during that two-year stretch, whereas it doesn't seem like Constans II was going to be able to achieve all that much of note during those two years. So why would Muawiyah want to put a war on pause that he was winning? Well, he saw that to really crack Byzantium, he needed a navy that was strong. So earlier in 649, this would have been a whole year before his victory at Eridus and his raid into Isauria and Cilicia, he had led a fleet to Cyprus where there were major Byzantine facilities. And while his fleet and the force on it had been strong enough to wreck the facilities there, they weren't strong enough to actually occupy the island. So he decided that he really needed to strengthen his fleet both in terms of numbers and in terms of training. So he spent the years of the ceasefire building more ships and training his fleet more. And to do that, he had to get uh, the Caliph to side with him. I believe the Caliph by this time was Uthman. Um, so this was one of the most important decisions that the early Caliphate made. And Muawiyah was the guy to lead this force. And in six. 54, he put this large navy into action and managed to capture the important naval base at Rhodes, which was on the southern coast of western Anatolia. So that means that he now has a station from which to raid and promote invasions of Byzantine core territories. He doesn't have to rely on trying to penetrate the Taurus Mountains anymore. So that is a victory of monumental importance. And one thing that Muawiyah did at this time, which really outraged Byzantine opinion, is that he collected all of the scrap of the Colossus statue, which had been laying in the streets of Rhodes for centuries by this point, and he sold it all for scrap. And that really just created um, outrage because a lot of people felt that their Hellenic heritage was being disrespected by, you know, this desert-dwelling barbarian Muawiyah. 
So this sort of causes a little bit of bad blood. And obviously, um, you know, the combination of this grand strategic threat and, you know, this um, callous disregard for Greek history uh, demanded that Constans had to do something. So in 655, Constans personally gathered his fleet together and then set out to engage the Arab fleet. The two fleets ran into each other somewhere around a place called Phinecus off the coast of Lycia, so this is also in the western portion of Asia Minor, and the battle was not a close one. Despite the fact that his navy was relatively new, Muawiyah's forces were far superior, and they completely crushed Constan's navy. Constans himself was only able to escape by trading clothes with one of his men, and when the Arab sailors saw that man dressed up like an emperor, uh, they made sure that he died. So Constans had to return to the capital, most likely with a very shattered force. Um, this is the first known instance of Constans II actually taking the field in person. Um, he was now age 25, and you would expect that he would have done this sooner. Presumably he needed time to really establish his legitimacy in the capital, maybe make sure that he had um, healthy children who were likely to live and come of age. Um, maybe he was it was just taking a long time to gather together a fleet, an army, because of the empire's um, resource restrictions. Really hard to know exactly why it took him so long. But given that the tradition from Maurice and Heraclius had been for the emperor to take the field, you would think that Constans II would have shown a little more haste in that regard. At any rate, um, another significant thing about the battle at Phinecus is that this was the first open water naval battle between the Byzantines and the Arabs, and by extension between the Christians and Muslims. So um, I think the, the last major naval battle will be Lepanto, or maybe there, there are a couple after that. But at any rate, um, so that will sort of inaugurate nearly a thousand years or so of um, naval battles between the East and the West. So now that he held Rhodes, had a strong fleet, and had defeated the Byzantine battle fleet, Muawiyah had a lot of options for doing tons of damage to the Byzantines. He could land in Asia Minor and try to conquer some of their core territories. He could try to gun for Constantinople while the Byzantines are reeling and demoralized. But ultimately what happens is that he receives news of the assassination of Caliph Uthman, someone he supported. And he learned that the next person who was claiming Khalifa authority was Muhammad's nephew Ali. And Muawiyah was not a big fan of Ali, um, mostly because he was a member of the Umayyad clan. And he, as such, he didn't have quite the family clout of someone who had a blood relation to Muhammad. So he knew that um, you know if, Mu if Ali gets into office and proves successful, that's a dangerous thing. And Muawiyah will then enter into a civil war with Ali. And the civil war is something that I don't really know the details of, so I won't say more lest I say something wrong. I do know that this war lasts for about five years, and during that time, um, Arab forces are mostly engaged in fighting each other rather than uh, continuing their conquest. And this will give the Byzantines a lot of much-needed breathing room. Of course, this is the period, as I mentioned earlier, when Byzantine forces reclaimed North Africa, at least temporarily. But uh, Constans will actually spend quite a bit of time fighting over Christology. And to be fair, while I put that comment in there partly as sarcasm and criticism, uh, it's possible that he, that was just his pastime while he was um, rebuilding his shattered navy and army. Um, so maybe the, the sources just don't record that because it's not quite as dramatic as what's about to happen next. So let's look at Const, uh, Constans the Bearded Autocrat and his dealings with the church in Rome. So just to review, in 646, Constans had forbidden any further discussion of Christological controversies, and then in 649, uh, the Pope had held a meeting and he and his fellow bishops had decided that the typos was illegitimate. Well, Constans was not going to take that sitting down, and he wasn't going to exchange reasoned letters with the Pope or have the Patriarch argue on his behalf. He decided to take a more vigorous stance. So he 
ordered his exarch in Ravenna, named Olympius, to arrest the Pope on the dubious grounds that his election had not been approved in Constantinople. Um, Olympius tried and failed to catch the Pope. For whatever reason, he wasn't able to pull it off. Um, and supposedly, according to papal sources, which of course uh, would say something like this, uh, Olympius came to view the Pope as being divinely protected. Otherwise, how would he have evaded capture? Anyway, um, at some point, Olympius had made peace with the Pope and then tried to start a revolt once he realized how unpopular the Byzantines were in Italy. Uh, for whatever reason, that revolt never really got a lot of popularity, and then he retreated to Sicily with his army, and he was hanging out for a few years, and then he died. So it's really, as far as usurpations go, one of the least interesting to ever happen. With most emperors, if they had ordered something quite as dramatic as arresting a pope, you would think that if that failed miserably the first time and resulted in an attempt at usurpation, that they might let the issue drop. But Constans II was a member of the Heraclean dynasty, and he did not know the meaning of the word quit. So, um, he sent a new exarch to replace the recently fallen Olympias, and when that exarch arrived in Italy, he immediately moved on to Rome and captured Pope Martin, then brought him back to the east. So Martin spent an entire year imprisoned on the island of Naxos. It's not really clear why, if I had to guess, it's because um, maybe the sea lanes were not safe at this point. Um, and maybe they were just looking for a time when they could ensure the safe passage of the Pope. Although, most likely, it had something to do with trying to soften him up or um, let public sentiment in his favor die down. I don't know. At any rate, um, by September of 654, he was finally brought to the capital after some 14 months of being under arrest. And then, when he reached the capital, he was imprisoned for 93 days before the trial. So apparently, Constans II did not believe in the right to a speedy and fair trial. At this tribunal, um, Martin is once again accused of having been elected illegally, and then a new charge is foisted upon him that he was helping and encouraging Olympias. Um, naturally, Martin said that he was not guilty of either charge, and Constans wasn't having that. Uh, the verdict was already decided before the trial was held. Um, and Constans then visited his friend, the dying Patriarch Paul, who had been excommunicated by the Pope some time before. And Constans was bragging about his treatment of the Pope and how the Pope was about to be executed, but the Patriarch had apparently been having nightmares about the afterlife and possibly being sent to hell and tortured for what he was allowing to go down with the Pope, so his dying wish to his old um, friend Constans was that he would spare the Pope's life and cease making him suffer. And Constans reluctantly granted that dying wish from his old mentor. Only after 85 more days in jail for Martin, though. And then he sent Martin to Cherson in the Crimea, which was a place that was considered desolate and shitty by the Byzantines. So um, it was kind of a place of punishment. If you had to be exiled somewhere, you'd want to go to one of the islands in the Aegean, where it's sunny and fairly warm. But apparently, Constans thought that Martin deserved some punishment, so he sent him to a place that was way colder than anywhere he'd ever lived before. And Con uh, Martin did not really live all that much longer from that point forward. So you might think that after getting rid of Pope Martin that Constans would be satisfied and that he would quit trying to provoke um, clashes of authority with religious figures who were sometimes more powerful than secular figures. But he did it once again. And this time he chose to go after Maximus the Confessor. Maximus was a learned theologian who had been attached to Byzantine life since at least the time of Heraclius. He'd apparently worked with Heraclius at one point in some capacity or other. Um, Maximus was learned in Neoplatonic philosophy, which was an impressive accomplishment at a time when it was not very widely studied. Um, he also uh, ended up being arrested by Constans and then put on a trial for charges which were not entirely clear. And then he also was sent to Cherson. And if I'm not mistaken, they would have, uh, Maximus and the Pope Martin, that is, 
would have been at Cherson for some period of time which overlapped, so I guess they could, uh, you know, discuss their woes and their grievances with the Emperor uh, in Cherson. So, from the 650s on, Constans had three sons who seemed healthy and destined to achieve adulthood, and those three sons were Constantine, Heraclius, and Tiberius, and he had all three of them associated with him on the throne, meaning that they were established as the heirs of to his power rather than his younger brother Theodosius. However, in 660, as his popularity was dipping due to some of the things he was doing which seemed high-handed, and also his uh, big naval defeat at the hands of Muawiya, um, Constans began to fear for his throne and saw his younger brother as a potential threat. So around 660, as he forced his younger brother to take holy vows and enter the church, and then in 660, he changed his mind and had Theodosius killed. Um, now by doing this, this is a sign that his unpopularity in the capital was reaching levels that were dangerous to him, and that he was trying to eliminate his biggest and most likely rival. So um, this will pretty much conclude uh, the extremely autocratic acts of Constans, or at least it will come close to it. Um, and from here on out, we'll see that most of what he does is fairly rational. Sometime around either 660 or 661, Constans II made his famous decision to go west. Now this is something that no sitting Byzantine Emperor had ever done. Um, if you look at every Emperor between Arcadius and Constans II himself, none of them had ever gone to the Western Empire while they were on the throne. And uh, other than Justinian, none of them had really been all that interested in the West. I mean I guess maybe Heraclius was, and Heraclius had considered relocating the capital temporarily to Carthage and regrouping, but for the most part, uh, the West was very much a secondary consideration for everyone who wasn't named Justinian I. So, uh, Constans II, though, decides to do something radically different than his predecessors. Well, what are his reasons? Primarily, I would say, he knew that the Arabs in North Africa posed a threat to his possessions in Italy and Sicily, and also the Lombards, after an initial successful invasion, were looking a little vulnerable and decentralized. So he was thinking, perhaps, that he would be able to protect uh, his possessions in Italy and Sicily, and also regain central and northern Italy from the Lombards if they were as weak as he had hoped. His, the secondary reasons in my mind, but reasons which are primary in the minds of a lot of people, are that... Uh, Constans was unpopular at home, and he wanted to avoid antagonizing the population there further. Also, um, something that I think is that maybe he was looking at the situation facing him on so many fronts and thinking that Constantinople had the bureaucratic know-how to get the most out of its territories in the east, and he needed to go west to better organize what he had there and get the most out of it, so that way the empire would be operating at peak efficiency and hopefully doing all that it could to um, fight back against the incursion of the Arabs. But um, again, it's not really 100% known why he did this, and it's also not known what his intentions were in terms of whether he would stay in the West or just visit. Leading an entire army and fleet all the way over to Sicily and Italy took some preparation, and, more or less, Constans II spent the entirety of 662 gathering his forces and preparing himself for the journey. So, during that year, he was traveling around Greece, and he spent most of his time at the Byzantine enclaves of Thessalonica and Athens. Remember, during this period, most of the Balkans, including most of Greece, was under Slavic occupation. So, presumably, uh, during this time, he also did things to help shore up local defenses, and perhaps he even laid the groundwork of some of the um, future themes that would crop up in the Balkans. Um, one of them was headquartered at Thessalonica, so perhaps uh, he was helping to oversee that, um, and maybe he was trying to do something similar at Athens. It's also possible he was just recruiting locals for his forces and gathering money and supplies. 
But at any rate, um, he left in early uh, 663, and he was in Tarentum with his army by the spring of 663, and he was ready to begin campaigning against the Lombards. At first, the Italy campaign was going swimmingly. Uh, Constan's force was simply larger, stronger, and better organized than any of the local Lombard forces in South Italy, and he was able to cut a swath all the way to the major center at Benevento, and he began laying siege. Well, not surprisingly, the garrison sent out a call for help to King Grimuald, who was at his capital at Pavia. When the messenger came back, Constans was able to seize the messenger, and he promised that he would um, not kill the messenger if he reported falsely to the city that the king had told them that they're on their own. But instead of doing that, the messenger revealed that the king was on his way with reinforcements. Constans cut down the messenger, but now the um, morale of Benevento was restored, and they were able to hold out, and uh, Constans was forced to leave and try something else. And after that, he visited the friendly city at Naples, and he also visited Rome. While at Rome, he received a formal reception from Pope Vitalian, and then he toured all of the city's various churches for about 12 days. This makes him the first emperor to visit Rome since the fall of the West, so that's a fairly big deal. And I'm not sure if there were any other Byzantine emperors after him who visited Italy. Uh, I don't know right offhand. Uh, perhaps someone in the comments will say something. I know that um, some sources claim that Constantine IV visited Sicily a couple times, but again, uh, I think that even those references are a bit uh, questionable. One thing that Constans II did, which uh, you know papal histories have pointed out and not been too happy about, is that he stripped away some of the remaining valuables from the classical Roman period, like the copper from the roof of the Pantheon, and he supposedly sent those materials back to Constantinople to be melted down and, you know, used to fund his war efforts. So in the autumn of 663, after a disappointing time in Italy, Constans II took his army and crossed over to Syracuse. And there he would remain for the next five years of his life, which also ended up being the last five years of his life. It's really unclear if he actually planned to make Syracuse his capital or whether he was just doing an impromptu extended tour that he hadn't intended in the first place. Um, it's also not clear whether maybe he wanted to set up an auxiliary capital in Syracuse and use that as a forward operating base uh, against the Arabs in the West. Um, so his plans are a little unclear and it's probable that a lot of the people who ended up being complicit in his assassination tried to spread the story that he wanted to stay in Syracuse indefinitely and ship the capital so that way um, the Greek authority figures would be sympathetic to the fact that they had killed the emperor uh, since they did not want to be away from their homes for the rest of their lives and they would have seen Syracuse as an inferior base when compared to Constantinople. Anyway, um, these same hostile sources say that tax collection under Constans II in Syracuse was brutal and including, in, included enslaving debtors who couldn't make their payments, sometimes forcing them to sell their children into slavery as well, and forcing women into prostitution so that they could raise enough money to pay these taxes off. Um, it's not clear whether this was hyperbole or simply the imposition of a full-on Byzantine tax system to subjects who were far enough away from the center of Byzantine power that they had not been subjected to this in the past and that maybe they were just reacting very uh, strongly. Or maybe these sources were written by people who just happened to hate Constans II or even the Byzantines more broadly. At any rate, um, he was murdered in his bath on September 15th, 668 by one of his Greek attendants um, and I guess we don't really know the exact reasons um, or if this was even a political killing maybe it was a personal thing I mean we've seen some evidence that Constans II may not have been the easiest guy to get along with so it could have just been a disgruntled employee who offed him when he had the chance or it could have been part of a conspiracy by a usurper who will rise up as soon as Constans body is cold 
So right after the death of Constans, Mizizios will claim the imperial authority in Sicily, and he'll end up reigning for about seven months there. He's a general who was of Armenian descent, and he was presumably one of the key officers for Constans in the West. At this time, he controlled Syracuse, and during that time, he was able to mint coinage in his own name. And because uh, Constans will be dead by the time that this guy takes power, his usurpation and potential threat to the unity of the empire will be a problem that Constans will pass on to his son, Constantine IV. So what was the legacy of Constans II the Bearded? Well, first off, he must have had the best beard of any emperor, since he is the only emperor to earn the nickname the Bearded. Also, he held the helm during a formative stage in one of Byzantium's greatest crises. This was a time when Byzantium and its very existence was endangered, and he had to adapt to the situation. Now granted, Heraclius had done quite a few things to try to get the situation stabilized, such as um, retreating behind the Taurus Mountains and using that as a defense line, but then the game changed in the time of Constans II once Muawiya started building ships, um, and he had to make further adjustments to protect his empire. He came up with an interesting strategy of going west and trying to, uh, you know, milk the teat there to a greater extent. Um, however, he wasn't really necessarily the man at the time demanded in the same way that his great uh, that his grandfather Heraclius had been. Heraclius was someone who proved to be a great general, and he was able to use his personal valor and his military skill to ultimately overcome what had been an overwhelming Persian victory. Um, and Constans II does not seem to have had the military skill to do that. Now maybe it was just that the Byzantine army and navy were outmatched by their Arab foes at this time. But at any rate, uh, he doesn't really have any great victories to his name. And when he died, the empire was in worse condition than when he inherited the throne due to Muawiya developing a fleet, capturing roads, and doing other things, especially the overrun of Egypt, which one can't really blame on Constans since he was so young at the time. However, all that aside, all that you know being relatively negative, the most positive thing that can be said about Constans is something which more than makes up for those other things, and that is that it looks like Constans II was the ruler who oversaw the implementation of the thematic system in its earliest stages, around 660 or so. And this is something we have to say with a bit of caution because the evidence is limited, so it's hard to know with any certainty if Constans II is the guy who made this happen. Certainly we know for a fact that Constantine IV set up at least a couple of themes, but maybe the system itself was an invention of Constans. And if that's true and Constans II is the person who invented the system, then this makes him one of the greatest reformers in Byzantine history, since the thematic system is what will eventually enable the Byzantines to survive this extended crisis during the 7th century and ultimately go on to reclaim its power in the next couple centuries after that. So while Constans did not have the most successful reign, he did set up his successors for great success and prolonged survival. So I think in that regard he is one of the most important emperors that Byzantium ever had, and someone who gets unfairly overlooked because despite his own many eccentricities he was simply outshone by his grandfather and by his own grandson as well.